praise you lord we give you thanks you are the most high god apart from you there is no other we give you glory oh god and this day as we are gathered in your presence we just pray that you'll minister to us oh jehovah god as we give you worship and praise we pray for your blessings oh god come down for us oh god hear us oh god as we call upon your name oh jehovah father let us hear your voice this day as you speak to us we bless you and we exalt you for you are the most high god amen 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 okay amen okay thank you so much praise and worship team for bringing us up to that point uh we are grateful uh uh for your work thank you so much praise the lord everyone uh it's one of those moments again when we meet online and we are glad to be in the presence of god today uh to hear what god has for us this particular day my name is Davis Ocheng. I'm married uh, to one wife, and God has blessed us with three beautiful children, two sons and a daughter. And I'm here today with the permission and blessings of my wife, and I'm very happy to be amongst you. So those who are joining us online, also welcome. It's, it's nice to have you. Uh, it's very nice to be here today in this men's forum so that we're able to discuss a few things that would be of consequence to us. Um, I come from Crisco New Life Church. Uh, there I minister amongst the youth. I'm in charge of the youth uh, uh, program there. And we minister there with my wife amongst many others. I'm also here with the blessings of the ministers from there. So it's really wonderful to be in your presence. Okay, without further ado, I'd just like us to say a word of prayer as we get into the word of God. Let's pray. Father Lord, in Jesus' name, we are grateful because you have brought us to you, O God. We are grateful because you called us from darkness into your marvelous light. We are grateful, O God, because you have a plan for our lives, because you have set us up, O God, to live a victorious life and thereafter to join you, O God, in victory, O God, at the end of our earthly lives, O God, indeed, at the end of human time. Lord, as we come before your presence this day to listen to your word, we are praying that your spirit may minister to us. Speak to us in your own unique way, each of us according to our need, each of us according to our destiny, that we may be able to hear from you, O Jehovah God. We invite your presence, we invite the Holy Spirit to be with us in this time so that we can do this together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. So I'd like to start by reading one scripture that is Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and verse 11. Uh, I'm reading from the New International Version, NIV as it's popularly known. And the Bible says as follows, Ecclesiastes 2 verse 11. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. Today we want to look at an issue that is of importance to every man that I know, and if it's not, it should be. This is the issue of legacy. Usually when we talk about our legacies, we are usually interested in what happens beyond my time. What happens after I have left the earth? What sort of things remain? What sort of impact do I have at that particular point? And today I'd like us to spend some time to just slowly go through this matter and see what God has to say about it and what wisdom lies in scriptures in regards to what the legacy of a man is supposed to be. So when we talk about legacy, I would like to bring it to you that this is one of those things that disturbs a number of people, particularly when you have gone on in age, and it's clear that it's not much time left on the clock, and you start wondering whether all the life that you've had was worth anything, whether it all amounts to something useful, or whether you are just another person chasing after the wind. This particular scripture that I have read, Ecclesiastes 2 and verse 11, uh, says as follows, I'll read it once more. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, the writer of Ecclesiastes is talking about a season in his life when he had the opportunity to sit back and look at everything he had done, to look back at all the things he had done. He says all that his hands had done and what he had toiled to achieve. And then he says everything was meaningless, 
are chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained after was gained under the sun. The preacher, as the Bible calls him, uh, wrote this to express what I would think was a disappointment with life. He was expressing the sentiment he had in his heart that all the effort he had put in, he was not seeing the meaning of it all. And he had done a lot of things. Prior to this verse, he lists a lot of things that he had done. If we had much more time, probably we could have gone back to look at that verse by verse. But the preacher says he had planted gardens. He had planted vineyards. He had done big construction projects. Indeed, when you look at the things he had done, he looks like the kind of man most of us would like to be today. You know, a man of projects, you have built buildings, you have planted chambers, you have bought shares. He was that kind of person and he had done a lot of big and influential things for his time. Yet here, towards the end of his life, I think, or a season when he had the opportunity to go back and look, this is what he says. Everything was meaningless. A chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained after, uh, under the sun. So as we start off, that's what I've used to lay a foundation for what we are going to discuss today. And I think in our hearts, really deep down, each man is afraid that when I've done it all, will it matter? When I have finished my walk on earth, when I've gone through my entire race and I'm coming out on the other end, will it matter? Will I have done the important things? How will I remember it? What will people say about me in the years to come, in the centuries to come? And that is the sort of place that I'd like to put ourselves for at least the next 30 or so minutes so that we can look at what God's word has to say. Now, in order for us to look at the issue of legacy, we need a working definition. And uh, the definition we have, I developed it specifically for today so that it captures the issues that we would like to have. Uh, the dictionary definition uh, gave me something along the lines of how you are remembered, how uh, you are uh, perceived uh, post your time on earth. And the other thing that it also said is a legacy could be what is left in terms of a sum of money for people who are left behind. Those were the dictionary definitions I have paraphrased heavily, but this is the one I'd like us to use today. I'd like us to define legacy as follows. Legacy is the cumulative impact of your worldview, your work, and your wealth on your family and society. I'll come again. Legacy is the cumulative impact of your worldview, your work, and your wealth on your family and on the society. So there are elements to this definition that I selected to put them here. I borrowed quite a bit from various places in order to put this together. But the first thing I wanted to bring out was this. That first, legacy is cumulative. Legacy is not what happens when you die. Legacy is not what remains after you walk through the earth. Legacy is something that as we keep on going through our journey on earth, it keeps on accumulating. I'll give you a very simple example. Um, we have a president who's about to uh, complete his second term, and there are people who report on some of the things he's doing today, saying those are legacy projects. You see, a day will come, he'll stop being president, and he'll move on to whatever else he'll move on to, yet that part of his presidency will have its own legacy. When you have been in a certain position at work or in business and you have been in it for a while, when your time to retire or your time to move to the next station comes, we usually look back and say, what is your legacy in this place? So when we think about legacy, I'd like us to think of it in cumulative terms. It's something that adds upon itself so that by the time we get to the end, we are not looking at the final marks you have along the lines of KCPE or KCEE. Uh, rather, we are looking at it along the lines of continuous assessment tests that were carried out at every stage in your life. So think of legacy as something that is cumulative, something that adds up, something that as you keep on going, it adds to itself. So that means every action you take is critical and is important in as far as legacy is concerned. The second one is impact. We did say legacy is cumulative impact. I want to assure you that so long as you are alive, you will have a legacy. Even if the only thing you do is sleep from morning to evening all your days on earth, you will have a legacy. 
Legacy is inevitable. Whether you like it or not, there will be an impact you will have had on this earth. Then the next three elements that I included in this definition were this. Legacy being the cumulative impact of number one, your world view. Number two, your work. And number three, your wealth. Allow me to quickly explain what I mean by those and then we can go into the meat of this matter. When I talk about your world view, I mean it's how you think in its, in, in its entirety. I would break it down further and say there are two elements to your worldview. There could be more, but for today we just need these two. One of those is your values. How you see the world is affected a lot by the values you hold dear, the things you consider important. When you do that, we say that is your worldview. If you look at the world from the eyes of a corrupt person, then you will have a corrupt worldview. And the second thing is your ideas about life and people. So I have defined worldview as what is constituted of your values and your ideas about people and life. Those two things constitute your worldview. How you see other people, how you value other people, how you interact with other people, the ideas you have as to how life works, that constitutes your worldview. If I was to use a scripture here, I would say that the closest I could get was a scripture that, say that, that says, so as a man thinketh, so is his heart. In other words, whatever goes on in your mind, that is also what's going on in your heart. And that can be said to be what constitutes your world view. So we will use that idea as we proceed. The next one is your work. There are two dimensions again to work that I want to bring up. Number one, when we say work, I want to mean your profession, the thing you do on a daily basis, the work you do, where you get your bread and butter, if we'd call it that. And number two, your mission in life, what I would call the purpose for which you are living for, what we would sum and say your life's work. There's the work where you may be employed or you may be running a business, your profession, that's a component. But the other one is, as you are living, what are you living for? What we would call your life's work. What are your greatest uh, impacts in this life? And that's what I want us to look at when we say work. You may be a teacher and your work involves going to class and preparing lesson plans and teaching classes. Yes, there's that. But in addition, it could be your life's work to encourage each child that you come into contact with and you spend time to make sure that the weak kids are able to get strong, that they have a good self-esteem. It may not be in your job description, but it's what you do. And things like that, when you follow, you will find that even when you are at home, they may not be your students in school, but you still have something inside that pushes you to encourage the children. When you grow old, you are the kind of grandparent that people will come around and they want to sit around and hear what you're saying. We could then say that your life's work constituted of encouraging others, particularly young people. So I want us to have that understanding of work as we move on. And thirdly, wealth. When we talk of wealth, I'll keep this one simple. By wealth, I simply mean money and anything you can convert into money. Money and anything that you can convert into money, whether it is shambas, whether it is buildings, whether it is shares, whatever else that you can convert into money that can be given a money sum. I will call that wealth. I understand that there are some who have more elaborate definitions of wealth, but for today, that will suffice. Okay. So let's now get into the meat of this matter so that we are able to see what legacy has to do with being a man and we finish this uh, in a way that's going to glorify God. The whole point of today is to ask ourselves, is there a way I can have a God-glorifying legacy as a man? And that's where we'll end up. That's the main question we're going to answer ourselves. I've divided this into three parts moving forward. First part, I'll look at uh, family and legacy. Uh, in a short while, I'll demonstrate that your family is the biggest theater for your legacy. Your family, more than any other one place, is where your legacy will play out. 
The second one is your legacy and the society. We will look at the impact of a human being, the impact of a man in the general society. And thirdly, I'll share two or three perspectives on what I believe need to go into getting a God-glorifying legacy for a human being. And that's where we will conclude. I'll spend a lot of time on at least uh, a bigger chunk of the time I have on legacy and family because I believe that that is easily the most important piece and even if we don't get to the others, that particular bit is going to be uh, the most critical one in this regard. So let's get into it. When we talk about one's family, the first thing that I'd like you to have in mind is your nuclear family. And hold that in mind as you go. Um, if you're married and you have a wife and children, um, I'm sure that's straightforward. If you're still young, you're not married, working on it, no problem. Hold these points. They'll be helpful to you at some point. And if you're beyond family also, don't worry. Just, just go with me as we go with that. So I mean your immediate blood relatives, the people that God chose for you. Uh, they say family are relatives that God chose for us and friends are relatives that we choose for ourselves. So in this case, the relatives that, you know, the friends that God chose for you, the people you live with, you have a blood relation with, those are the people I'd like you to have in mind as we talk about family and your legacy. Now, I read uh, the book of Exodus, chapter 5, sorry, chapter 20 and verse 5. I'll read that scripture first before I say uh, my first point on the family. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 5, the Bible says, You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Okay? Of those who hate me, but showing love to those, uh, to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commands. Allow me to truncate the scripture uh, and start from the Lord your God. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to th uh, a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commands. Okay, yeah, it's a bit of a mouthful, but this is what essentially that scripture is saying. God is saying that for those who love him, He's going to show love for, thousand, for a thousand generations. And for those who hate him, he's going to punish the children up to the third and fourth generation. Now, I'm not going to go into many details around generational issues. I just want to extract a little mathematics from this. At a minimum, you will have an impact on your family down to the third generation. At least, depending on your relationship with God. Let me state this whole point like this. Depending on your relationship with God, your legacy will have an impact on your family lasting anywhere from three generations to a thousand generations. Depending on your relationship with God, your legacy will have an impact on your family lasting anywhere from three generations to a thousand generations. God doesn't say any other thing like this in any other type of relationship. But when it comes to your family, God says that for those who hate him, the sins of the fathers will be visited down at least to the third generation. So it means that whatever happens, the next three generations are currently being influenced. Your next three generations are currently being influenced by your relationship with God as to whether you love him or hate him. And if you love God, God is saying that he will show love for a thousand generations. In biblical time, we should have been alive for about 7,000 years in terms of that's the entire span of human history. And one generation, I, I saw very many different estimates of how long it lasts. And if we use the very simple definition of a generation is the time it takes your firstborn to get a firstborn. So I'd put it somewhere at around 30, 35 years, 40 for a nice round number. A thousand generations would mean 4,000 years if we go by that. If we extend it to 70, as some do, then it means 7,000 generations. In other words, if we were to mark a generation as a period of 70 years from the day of creation to today, 
then it means that all that time, God would have been showing love to a particular family because someone at the top of that line loved God. So what I want to put to you this morning, uh, rather this afternoon, is that your actions, your relationship with God has an impact immediately on at least the next three generations, but it would go all the way to a thousand generations. In fact, what I think God means when he says thousand generations, simply by, you know, the very long time that that relates to, God must mean a timeless relationship with the people following you. So you loving God is one element that has an impact on your legacy and that of your descendants many, many uh, uh, years, generations down the line. So that is the first point. Depending on your relationship with God, your legacy will have an impact on your family lasting anywhere from three generations to a thousand generations. The second point I want to make is through the concept of inheritance, your legacy will play out primarily through your family through the concept of inheritance, your legacy will play out primarily through your family. I have said concept of inheritance because I want to look at various aspects of that. Uh, the way human societies are organized, when one generation finishes its time, they hand over whatever they have to the next generation. Or at least that's what we think is supposed to happen. Now, I want you to listen to what the Bible has to say about this matter so that we have a good sense as to how this whole deal works out. Proverbs 13 verse 22 says, A good person leaves an inheritance for their children's children, but a sinner's wealth is stored up for the righteous. A good person leaves an inheritance for their children's children, but a sinner's wealth is stored up for the righteous. So the Bible says if you are a good person, you are supposed to leave an inheritance for your children's children. In other words, your children are covered. Whatever you have flows down to the second generation. A good person. So when we talk about inheritance, there is supposed to be some wealth that comes from you that moves down two generations, praise the Lord. Uh, well, it's not saying that everyone will get the capacity to do it, but that's one thing that should happen to a good person. If you are a good person, there is a scripture you can run with, go fast and pray with it and see that God gives you what you will leave to your children and children's children, praise the Lord. <laughs> How I miss the amen of a crowd. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the next thing I want to point out under the general concept of inheritance is Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 11. The Bible says, wisdom like an inheritance is a good thing and benefits those who see the sun. Uh, this is Ecclesiastes. So when he says those who see the sun, he essentially means human beings who are alive. So the full verse reads, Wisdom, like an inheritance, is a good thing and benefits those who see the sun. Um, probably he's saying if you're dead, you have no use for wisdom. <laughs> but what struck me was this. He's trying to find something to compare wisdom with. And we see the word like. So he says, wisdom, like an inheritance. If those two concepts are similar in the eyes of the writer of Ecclesiastes, then it must mean that there's something about wisdom that can be applied in the area of inheritance. There's something about wisdom, I dare say, that can be inherited. Praise the Lord. There is a component of wisdom that can be inherited. And I will go further on a limb and say that when we talk about biblical wisdom, we are usually talking about biblical values. There's a verse I know, in fact, it was the motto for my primary school when I was in primary school. And the verse would say, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So wisdom in biblical terms is tied to godly values. You cannot speak of wisdom if there is no godliness in it, at least not in biblical terms. The world may have other things. And this is what I want to bring up. That when we are talking about what your children are inheriting, one of the things that you need to pass on to them is wisdom. 
One of the things that you need to pass on to them is biblical values. One of the things that you need to pass on to them is a character that says we have been touched by a man who knew God. We have been raised by a man who knew God. Because if you do not pass on that wisdom, there will be consequences. We shall see that in a minute. And while we are talking about this and looking at this in the line of your work, if you are someone who cannot explain to your children how you make money, if you cannot, particularly based on moral grounds, explain to your children how you make the money that you make, then there's a chance that you need to go and sit down with God and have a discussion about that issue. Because that is one of the things that God uh, would use to pass on values to your kids. If your kids do not understand where your money is coming from, you cannot sit and explain to them, this is how I make money. Because particularly of moral issues, then you need to go and ask God again, is this what I am supposed to be doing in my life? I also dare say that you cannot raise honest children with dishonest wealth. If they end up honest, they will not like you in the end because they will see what you have done. When kids grow up, they ask questions. They will see what you have done and they will tell, my father was not honest. If they themselves are honest. But if you raise dishonest children while trying to raise honest one, while using dishonest wealth, then it just means you have multiplied evil in the world. If they found that you are someone who cut corners, paid bribes, stole things, grabbed land, and they become exactly like you, then you will answer to God why you multiplied evil, why you sent it far to the next generation. You cannot raise honest children with dishonest wealth, no matter how hard you try. In fact, it's better not to have much, but to have a good character. That would be a stronger inheritance for your children compared to anything else. I'll touch on this just a little more as I move down. Um, the third thing I'd like to point out, also within the general framework of inheritance, is a good name. Proverbs 22 and verse 1, the Bible says, A good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. Here is what I mean. When God gives you a good name, or when you're able to maintain your reputation such that you have a good name here on earth, that good name would be the thing your kids will eat from for generations to come because their name is associated with the name of a good man. Let me give you an example in the opposite. We know our history as a country, and there are certain people who we know did a lot of injustice, particularly around the issues of wealth in our nation. And when they did, they got children, and we know their children. When you meet someone, and they tell you what their second or third name is, and you realize, hey, this person belongs to that family, immediately there are certain connotations that come to your mind. There are certain thoughts that you start thinking about this individual because of their father's bad name. Hallelujah. Let me skip it forward to a different person. Uh, one of the well-known people in, in the Christian circles was, was Billy Graham. Imagine today if you meet a child or grandchild whose last name is Graham, and they tell you, I am a grandchild or great-grandchild of Billy Graham. Immediately you're expecting to see a God-fearing person. Whether you know them or not, you will start giving them favors. Even if they do not serve in their church, it is likely that if they walked in here one Sunday and you learned that the great-grandson of Billy Graham has come, they might be seated next to the ministers or at least close enough to the high table as the church would allow because you are expecting that the good name of their father has come down all the way. There is a lot of power in a good name. Maintain a good reputation and it will open doors for you beyond places. Hallelujah. Oh, the missing church. Say amen where you are. <laughs> we will hear it in the spirit. Hallelujah. <laughs> okay. And here are the implications for, on some of those uh, elements we have raised. Um, when we are talking about blessing your children, and you want to uh, bless, you, bless your children, you are trying to leave a blessing uh, um, to your particular children, so that when they're done with their lives, or rather when you're done with your life, you are leaving a blessed set of children. I, I don't know whether we take the time to really think it through. 
Now, what I'd like to propose is along those three lines of wealth, a good name, and good values that you need now. You need to bless your children now with your wisdom, your experience, and your presence. Hallelujah. This is the time to do it. And this is what I mean. When you have grown up as an individual and, you know, you are 30-some, 40-some, 50-some, you, you have raised your children. Why are you waiting until you are an old man in the 70s and 80s and probably having forgotten half the experiences in life to start sharing that wisdom with your children? If your children can get all the wisdom you have had in life and they start their lives with that, you have set them up for greater success than yourself. But if you wait for them to make all the mistakes you made, as you watch them make all the mistakes, and then in the end you tell them, actually, you are not supposed to go this way. You are supposed to go the other way. You are missing the point. And when I say you need to bless them with your wisdom, that's one of the things. Number two, uh, your experience. You need to let them understand the things you have gone through and how they affected you. Because those are the things that will inform how they look at life and how they make decisions in life. And the third thing I'd like to stress, particularly for men, is your presence. Bless your children with your presence. When they are very young, I like to say they just need gross presence. Whether you are the president of the World Bank or of Kenya, when you go home to your two-year-old, what they want is a back that they can ride on because they see you as a donkey or a cow. Those other details are for those other people. At that time, they simply need you around so that they can feel your presence. When they go into their room and lock the door behind them, they know that is in the other room. If anything happens, he will show up. There's a point where all you need is gross presence. As they keep on growing up and they want less and less to do with you, as I hear, my kids are still young, then at that time, you need to have quality time. Probably spend moments of time, but make sure they are still there. But pass on something to them. Bless them with your presence. So that one day, when you are dead, and we have come to the service, when we are about to bury you, and we hear your children say, we were blessed to have him as our dad, I would like for that to be true. Bless your children now with your wisdom, your experience, and your presence. Don't wait to pronounce your blessings on your deathbed. That is a good thing and has its value. But as you are still alive and you are still strong, your kids are still young, bless them. Give them that blessing now. And the blessing I'm asking for is your wisdom, your experience, and your presence. Um, as we do that, I'm reminded of the former president of Ghana, uh, Jerry Rawlings. I once watched a documentary where he was giving the story of his life. And he says that at some point, when he felt they needed to take action in Ghana at a political level, he had been in the military at the time, he realized he needs to get involved. And they uh, had a coup uh, happen in Ghana. He was one of those who were uh, in the coup. So he says at that particular time, when he transitioned himself from being a military officer to become a politician, in effect, uh, a military ruler for the country, he says that he had to distance himself with his children because he was always afraid he may not make it home in the evening. Someone might kill him somewhere along the line. And for that reason, he created an emotional gap between himself and his children. So when he was giving this interview, you could almost see tears in his eyes saying that he felt he needed to pay such a sacrifice so as to keep his children safe from any trauma or any pain that would have come had he died while uh, uh, leading the country of Ghana or at least during the process of getting that coup going. So uh, that is an example of a father who was not able to be present for his children and he had his reasons. So I would encourage you strongly to try and minister to your children with your presence. When they are younger, they simply need you there. Your physical presence is, pre is uh, very important. As they grow older, you still need to have input in their lives, even though they are more independent even though they may have less to do with you and want to listen to their friends more. You still need to maintain a voice in their lives somehow so that you can speak to them. Now, the other point I'd like to raise uh, is when you are transferring wealth as a Christian, as a man, you need to realize that you should only transfer wealth after you have transferred values. I'll use two examples to explain this. Um, when you take your child uh, uh, to a driving school, and um, let's say they have turned 18, yes, it has to be 18, and they come back and tell you they can now drive. And they tell you that they'd like to borrow your car 
to go and do something, probably something that's not controversial. The decision to give them that car will be influenced by what your understanding is of their capacity to take care of that vehicle from the moment you put it in their hands to the moment it comes back. And the things that would have impacted this is what kind of child are they? If you know that they are generally careful with things, you will have less trouble. But if they have been troublesome children, you did not raise them to take care of things, you yourself will have trouble giving them your car. You will also ask yourself, when I have been driving and they were in the car, how did they see me drive? If they saw you abusing other drivers, cutting lanes, disobeying uh, traffic officers, disobeying traffic laws, and doing all other manner of things, then I would need to say that they, you, you yourself will not feel confident enough to give them the vehicle because you do not think they are qualified to drive it. Before you transfer wealth, make sure you have transferred values. It is the values that will help maintain the wealth that you give them. Uh, because of time, allow me to skip one of the last examples, but see this point. When you transfer wealth, transfer it in a transitional manner, not as one big lump sum. And have a very big reasons for that. That reason is Proverbs 20 verse 21. The Bible says, an inheritance claimed too soon will not be blessed at the end. It does not say whether it's going to someone who's born again or not. It just says an inheritance claimed too soon will not be blessed at the end. Of course, too soon might mean much earlier than when anticipated. But hey, things happen in life. Supposing God takes you much earlier than you thought you would go, and suddenly your kids find themselves in a situation where they have to manage your estate. We were having a discussion with a friend of mine about two weeks back, and he was telling me of this situation of a man who built a flat. And after he did, it appears there was no one else amongst his family or friends who knew that he had the flat. So this friend of mine had a friend living in that flat, and he says that when their landlord died, no one has ever come for rent ever since. In other words, no one else knows that he owned this property. Now, if you are hoping to leave that building to your children, but they do not see that at a certain time of the month, you go and knock on doors and get rent. When you are not in the picture, how do you expect them to suddenly learn that the rent is gotten by going and knocking in people's houses? Wait, you might tell me it's paid to the bank account. If your kids do not know that the rent is paid into a bank account, and believe me, that can be possible, how do you expect them to be able to manage the house? If your kids do not know that there are rates that are paid on property, that there are bills, that a building needs to be maintained, because when you do those things, you are not with them, how do you expect them to learn those things after you have gone? I will finish with this example. We clearly will not have time to go all the way, but I'll finish with this one example. Um, there's this proverbial story told of a Patel. He takes his son, uh, the son is called Patel, to more or less the same school that you take your children. And Patel, uh, as they close during the holidays, your kids stay at home and, you know, play on Playstations and go around malls, see what's new. But Patel is in his father's hardware, doing the hard work, bringing the nails and helping carry the mabatis. Your children keep on growing and they're friends with Patel. They get to 18. Patel now is able to supervise the workers in the hardware. Your son finishes and they start asking themselves, what am I going to do with my life? And as they work on it, they, they discover they passed well and they can go to campus and do a nice course. And your son decides, I want to be an accountant. Off they go. Patel by 18 has the choice. It's not an obligation. He can either go to campus or he can keep working in his dad's hardware as a supervisor. And after four odd years, probably six if, six if there are strikes involved, your child finishes school and he comes out and now he needs a job. Guess who he will call for an accountant's job? You see, the hardware has been growing all these uh, 15, 16 years and now it has become a big place. So by the time that uh, your son is going to ask for a job from Patel, Patel has had over 10, 15 years experience in that particular hardware. What happened? Over time, his parents were transferring the secrets of the business to him. They did not suddenly die when Patel was 25, and suddenly Patel has to take uh, uh, responsibility for that. So 
That is what we have to do. We have to transfer wealth transitionally, step by step. That is it for the day. It's been a pleasure being with you. God bless you so much.